people. So my story starts in the late 1970s, and I was gang raped by two American teenagers when I was just 13 years old. This podcast is going to be quite different from the ones that I have done before. However, with the advent of hashtag me too and the whole sexual harassment sexual abuse cases that are popping up all over the world i still felt it was important and very appropriate and relevant to interview madeline black and hear her story we will in this interview look at the business side of things as well Madeline is an accomplished speaker, psychotherapist, and now also an author. And these are all things that people who are in business aspire to achieve. So I think it's important that you can hear from her how all of these things have come about. And sometimes you don't plan how you are going to evolve and what you're going to be doing in life. And there might be a significant trauma event like the one that Madeline has experienced before you start to discover what it is that you should be doing in life. So please listen to the whole interview and hopefully it will help you. It may help a family member, a friend, somebody else in the world that will allow them, as Madeline has done for many thousands of other women and men, to share their story, finally, to be free from what they've experienced in previous years. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Madeline. How are you today? I'm doing really well, thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really, really appreciate it. And I really want to delve into a number of different areas. And it is going to be an unusual podcast for my listeners uh, or our listeners today because of your story and your background, which we'll get into. But just to kind of highlight for our listeners that with the, the hashtag Me Too movement that has been going on for a number of years and is really coming to the fore. I, I am pleased that we're having this discussion today and exploring it in a bit more detail because you've experienced some of this when you were very young, which we'll get into in a moment. But I also would like to get into the business side of your life as well. And you're an accomplished author, speaker, psychotherapist, and I'd like to get into that definitely as well. But of course, we do need to hear a little bit about the background and the story, how you got there. So if it's OK with you, let's start the story with a little bit about your personal life and we'll get into what has happened to you when you were very young. But tell us where you were born, a bit about your education, where you you know, have moved around in the country or abroad, and obviously about the story, which is the important bit in connection with with the incident and the, the Me Too movement, etc. And then we'll just naturally flow into the business side of things, Madeline. Is that okay with you? Um, yes, I am a Londoner, but I've lived in Glasgow now for the last 25 years. I've always worked, uh, since I've lived in Glasgow, with women's organisations. I was a worker at Women's Aid Group, supporting women once they left refuge. And then I was a volunteer at Rape Crisis, helping on the phone lines. And it was then I became interested in counselling to become a better support worker. And I trained as a counsellor, which led on to psychotherapy. And as you mentioned, I recently published my memoir last year, in fact, nearly a year ago, April the 4th. And since then, I've started to share my story publicly by speaking in many different kind of events, book festivals, conferences, schools, whoever asks me. Um, my education isn't much because my, I'd say I'd went to the University of Life. My education was quite interrupted because I experienced a trauma at such a young age and it affected my schooling. Okay, so 
Let's let's go to the trauma then. Let's find out a little bit about what happened to you so that everybody gets a sense of uh, where you've come from. Sure. So my story starts in the late 1970s and I was gang raped by two American teenagers when I was just 13 years old. And how did that affect you in the following years? Oh, it affected me in so many ways because to start with, I couldn't find my voice. It took me about three years till I could actually tell my parents. And even then I couldn't say it verbally. I could only write a note and leave it on my pillow. And I do believe what we speak about, it leaks out of us in different ways. So when I look back now, I can see that I was a very traumatized young woman, um, had PTSD, but I didn't know about it. I had a suicide attempt, eating disorder. I would do anything to numb out and not feel as hopeless as I felt. Uh, became very promiscuous, which I know is quite a common uh, side effect of being raped. I mean, there's no set way, uh, ways that people will react, men and women will react in many different ways. Mm. But I just really hated myself for years. I felt worthless, useless. Uh, yeah, it wasn't a good space. <laughs> no. And, but at some stage, you resolved it. I mean, I, that's not a good word to use. You'll never yeah. resolve it. But there is something inside of you that change. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I would say actually I have got to a place where I really am at peace with all that happened. But you know, this didn't happen overnight. It's been a long process to get to where I'm at. Um, you know, when I was very heavily using drugs and drinking, my parents thought it would be a good idea to send me away to get away from the, the people that I was connecting with. And I went to Israel for a year and it was there that I met my husband. And that was a huge turning point. You know, I couldn't understand at first why this man wanted to be with me. How could he love someone like me? And I would drive him mad. But he just loved me. And that's all he did. And then I saw through his love that I actually was lovable. I wasn't as awful as I, as I thought I was. And I was able to give love back. So that really, I think, was the start of me defrosting. I felt like I'd been put in the deep freeze for a long time. And, and how old were you then? I met him when I was just 17. <laughs> Okay. So quite a few years ago now, about 35 years ago now. Right. So that's not long and after. It wasn't long after, no. It wasn't long after at all. And so, I mean, he's, he must be a remarkable guy. Um, to put up with me, yes. <laughs> well, that's not the right word to use, is it? But, um, no, I know. Because... He is very grounded and just very grounded, solid individual. Mm. And supportive and loving, obviously. Yes. And because how long do you think it's taken you to get to the place? Or, you know, you met him when you were 17, you said. Yep. Well, I think, it's as I said before, it's a process. There's many, many layers to healing. For example, when I first met Stephen, I said I would never have children. And he was OK with that. And we got married. And every now and again, he would ask me the question, how about starting a family? And I remember the exact moment when I totally reversed my thinking. We were away in Thailand on a beach. I can picture the very beach. And he asked me the question again. And I was all ready for the usual answer of, you know, I can't have a family because I thought in my mind it would be too much like being raped again. And I didn't want to put myself through that. I was terrified at the thought of giving birth. But I thought, you know, if I never become a mum, then I'm giving all this power and control over these to these two young men. And I didn't want them to have that power over me. And it was then that I came up with a plan which I call my best revenge, which would be to live a life as good as I possibly could. And I thought, I've now had three children, that that was it. That was my healing. But it comes back again later on, many years, when you think you're done, another wave or another layer of trauma can come back in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And is this something that happens? To, I mean, I know you said it's different for everybody, mm -hmm. but the you're obviously working with organisations that help other people that have gone through similar traumas. Yeah, but and is that a pattern you can see out there? Or 
Yeah, well, there's, there's, there's many, many ways that you can respond, and there's no right or wrong way. But yes, fear of giving birth is one of them. Uh, there's many, many ways to respond. Uh, eating disorders, numbing out, suicide attempts, depression, yeah, hopelessness, worthlessness, feeling dirty, contaminated. There's many ways to respond. And it's not to be underestimated and how, the kind of suffering that people go through. And do you think that we're well equipped in this country to to help people that have gone through that? Uh, not really, no. There's never enough resources. When I worked at Rape Crisis, women were, um, they could get 10 face-to-face -face sessions and the workers there, we all did the best that we could, but at that moment, they weren't therapeutically trained. So mm. there were no trained counsellors. We were support workers, which had, you know, some training. But uh, 10 sessions, really, you know, it's, it's not much at all. No. I had, I had counselling to become a mum, and then I thought I was okay. And it was whilst I was studying psychotherapy, my eldest daughter turned 13, that suddenly all my memories returned, all the things that were done to me. And it took me even as a psychotherapy student, another three more years of private therapy to really come to where I'm at today. Yeah. And what would you like to see change in, you know, in these services or the support? Have you got some ideas around that? Yeah, well, there so many changes need to be done. I mean, we could start with the judicial service. I mean, in Scotland, where I live, out of the 15% of cases that are reported that make it to court, only about 4% will end in a conviction. So there's so many uh, things wrong with the justice system to start with, which then put women off from reporting. And then it just keeps perpetuating. Uh, there's so, such a lack of services for people to get support. Mm. It's it's really it's not a pretty picture. No, and there needs to almost be, I sense a campaign <laughs> behind, you know, the Me Too movement, which yeah, is absolutely. the reporting of it. But it's then how do we create more support? It's I think it's good that we're exposing the perpetrators, mm -hmm. you know, in in terms of getting it out there and reporting them, but then how do we actually manage to then get the support, get the justice system corrected? And there almost needs to be a movement around that, Madeline. Are you up for, for oh, taking absolutely. that on? <laughs> no, I think, I mean, it's great what happened on Twitter and Facebook, and it gave voices to women that had been silent for many, many years. I mean, it took me 35 years to share my story publicly, but some women and men were sharing their story for the first time. So I think within the first hour on Twitter, it was something like 12 million women had retweeted Me Too. Mm. And most men I speak to are surprised and most women I speak to aren't surprised at all. We, we knew about all the harassment and sexual violence that takes place every day for most women. Um, but yeah, absolutely, we need to find a way to take Me Too off social media and put some action behind it. Mm. It's, it's great that it's raised awareness, but what are we going to do after that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, and of course we know, and your trauma happened in a social setting, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, you know, a lot of this happens in the business world, as yeah. we know. And um, it's almost because of the power and control that, and yeah, this could be men and women, and we mustn't just say it's only men, but of course men, um, I'm I'm sad to say, uh, do it more probably, but it's the power that they impose over women in the workplace. Absolutely, and it's, it's never about sex or desire. It's always about power and control. Yeah, any any form of abuse, whatever the abuse is, is just power and control and misusing your position. Yeah. And I've witnessed it over the years that I've been in work. I've witnessed it by some of the people at the very top of the organization and what they were doing to women mm -hmm. and how they treated them. But, you know, there wasn't this kind of movement around where I could report it or go and tell somebody about it. We talked about it mm. amongst ourselves and said, oh, how terrible is this that this guy's doing it? 
and unfortunately nothing was done you know yeah, well well let's hope now things will be different we've raised the consciousness of people more men are aware so it really takes for men to speak out and to say look that's not acceptable you can't treat whoever like that whoever it's male or female it takes for, it's not just a woman's issue it's on all of us yes i totally agree yeah so how did you decide to get into psychotherapy and i know that's a kind of obvious question but i still well, want to ask well it might not be so obvious <laughs> it was actually my father is or was a holocaust survivor and i was always very intrigued at a young age how people could have the same experience and come out very different unfortunately his parents his brothers and sisters most of them died and only he and his sister survived but my auntie eva was um paranoid schizophrenic agoraphobic ocd really very affected by obviously her experience in auschwitz and my father if you met him was full of life I just mucked about he was like a child he laughed a lot and i see now his laughter was his strength so it always intrigued me how these two people similar experience obviously it's never going to be exactly the same but they came out so different why was one more resilient than the other you know what was in my dad mm. that my aunt didn't have mm. so that always intrigued me and that still intrigues me with clients how i can get two clients with very similar issues and i realize that everything is our attitude that we bring to life you know it's it's not really what happens to us that's important it's what we do with what happens yes and my father not by what he said but how he lived his life i saw that if we really choose to you know we can get past anything that happens to us and so that took you on the journey of psychotherapy then it did i mean as i say i started as a support worker and i really only intended to get a counseling diploma degree to become a better support worker but then i fell in love with therapy and psychotherapy mm. and so i left the voluntary kind of um counseling support services and i ended up becoming a counselor and a psychotherapist and do you specialize then in rape victims sexual harassment victims and abuse or do you cover other psychotherapy for well it's it's interesting because at college they used to say you get the clients that you need your clients are a gift and i don't specialize in any particular subject people can come to me with any aim or goal or issue that they want to work on but somehow <laughs> i seem to attract a lot of rape survivors abuse survivors whether that's because it's out there so much or it's just the law of attraction they end up coming to me because i can work it you know nothing unfortunately really shocks me anymore no no i understand yeah Okay so so the the and is this you doing this on your own or do you have a team of people No I I work within a center a really lovely center so I do a mixture of donation clients and clients that pay it is through the church of scotland so we're expected to give 3 hours of our time voluntary which I do yes. and then I see clients that kind of jump the waiting list so, but I see them there as well I don't really see I don't have a private practice or anything No and um and we need more of it don't we we need more of it to be available to yeah, larger yeah exactly yeah we we've had to cut our viewing time that we can offer to people and you know before it was open ended but we have a huge waiting list and now clients can only get 20 sessions which i feel very mixed about i've had clients that i've worked with for years and they've been back two or three times and they wouldn't really get where they got to if they had just had 20 sessions but it's still a lot better than what most centers offer so we have to be realistic and find a way to work our waiting list oh well well done with that mm -hmm. and and it's it is really really sad to hear that people are having to wait for these things because yep. you know there could be even one session could help them Absolutely. you know move forward a little bit um uh, than being stuck on a waiting list it's nothing worse no so Now I'm I'm really interested to hear also how you then decided to write your story in a book mm -hmm. and sure. what made you decide to do that. Oh, well I've been going to a teacher I suppose we could call him a teacher of life for many years and he suggested to me in about um 2010 it would be really helpful for me to write my story down and my instant 
reaction was, there's no way I couldn't let you read what was done to me. I was so ashamed and embarrassed. You know, somehow I felt that if people knew the details of what was done to me, that it was a reflection of me in some way. But I stopped and started it, and I couldn't do it. I would put it away. But really, about four years after he asked me, my fingers went into automatic, and within moments, you know, like I'd written about 12 pages. And somehow I met the Forgiveness Project founder, Marina. We kind of met through the powers of social media, and she shared my story. And they often run events, but they're always in London. And she messaged me and said, there's an event taking place in Glasgow. It's at Shawlands Academy. Is that near to you? I said, oh, it's about two minutes from my house. So I went along to hear this event. It was very close. And it was a woman called Marion Partington, and her sister Lucy had been murdered by Rose and Fred West, the serial killers. Yes. And, you know, I saw the effect that she had on the room. And Marina, the founder, often refers to us as story healers rather than storytellers. And in that moment, something came in and I thought, I could write a book. I, I don't even have an English O level, so I don't know where that thought came from. <laughs> but as soon as I had that thought um, at night, I couldn't sleep because I would see words flying around in my mind. And when people tell me that, you know, my book wrote itself, I never understood what they meant. But yes. really, I felt like I was just the typewriter. I would sit down the next morning and the words just came out of me, the chapter titles, and then all the words would flow. And in about eight weeks, I had written 70,000 words. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. So it, yeah. So it kind of came to me at night or in my dreams, I suppose you could say. But, yeah, the words really just felt like they just poured out of me. So I guess when you're ready to tell your story, you are ready to tell your story. Mm. And initially, I was really, I didn't ever imagine it would be a book. I was just thought, it's really good for me. I'm just going to write down all the details, get everything out of my system. And then I thought, well, this is a book. <laughs> and then luckily, I found a publisher in just about three months after I started sending my submissions away. And it was published last year. Well, that's that's a bit of a success story in terms of yeah. book writing, isn't it? In I think so. I think I'm quite lucky. <laughs> but it's also a really important message to get out there for people to read mm -hmm. and so that people get a better understanding of what's going on. Absolutely. And, you know, I was very honest in my book. When I first met my friend who's an editor, he helped me, Joe, who lives in Los Angeles, he said, you will write all the details of what you wrote in those 12 pages. I said, no way. I said, I can't let people read that. Mm -hmm. And he explained to me that as a man, when he read what I had written originally, he said it really helped him to understand what can take place during a rape. And he felt it was really important to put all the details in because he just assumed that you'd be, you know, overpowered by a bigger man and you couldn't fight back. But he said when he read what had happened to me, it really changed something in him. So he worked on me and worked on me. And then I agreed. Yes, OK, I'm fine. All the details can go in. It was interesting because I thought I wasn't ashamed anymore, but clearly I was still working my shame. Mm. So when I got my contract with my publishers and we came to the chapter of uh, it's called all of one night with all the details they thought maybe we shouldn't put the details in and by then I was adamant <laughs> I said no they have to go in we can't if I am going to tell my story now I don't want to sanitize it I don't want to make it cleaner and prettier so people won't feel uncomfortable when they read it because we should feel uncomfortable yeah. it is a horrible thing that takes place every day on this planet to men and women and children all over the world so I was very very definite that it had to go in. So we have included it, but it, that chapter now comes with a big warning in italic that, you know, if you read on, this is what you expect. So, but it, I think it works okay. Most people think that they owe it to my former 13 year old self to read the details. And some people, you know, they, they practice self care. Maybe it's too triggering for them and they won't read that chapter, but that's, that's fine as well. Yeah. It gives people the option, doesn't it? To Absolutely either refuse or have a better understanding. And I think yeah. you're right and I'm, it, it needed to go in. I agree with yeah. you. I agree yeah. with you. And so, also it really, it helped me. It really, my, I felt my shame just crack and it's disappeared. I, I now know that I have nothing to be ashamed about. It was something, you know, that was done to me. It was never, ever my fault. It's never a victim's fault. And, and that is the message that I want to get out as well. And tell us a little bit about the Forgiveness Project then, once you found that. How sure. has that influenced you? 
Well, I didn't ever really expect to forgive these two young men. Um, it was whilst I was having the therapy when all these memories returned that my therapist suggested to me that maybe they weren't born rapists. And at first, I was outraged. I thought, how dare he suggest that to me? I thought they were sadistic animals and evil and all the rest of it. But, you know, he planted a seed in my mind and it started to grow. And I really wanted to understand what had taken place. How had they become so conditioned that they could be so violent to another person? And I really wondered what had they seen? What had they heard? What had they experienced? Because I believe we are all born the same. You know, my manager where I work now used to be a midwife. And she told me years ago that um, she's delivered thousands of babies, but she never once met an evil baby. No. And, and that always stayed with me. So I believe they came in the same as you and I. And when I really took that in, I started to feel compassion in my heart towards them. And when I didn't have forgiveness, I was full of hate and anger and revenge. And it had nothing to do with them. They had no idea. It was only hurting me and my family. So when I brought forgiveness or understanding in, I felt compassion towards them because they've got to live with what they did to me. I chose to heal. But also I saw that, um, you know, I'm not what they did to me. I'm more than my body. The real essence of me can never be touched and the same for anyone. But forgiveness has really brought me in peace and it's allowed me to let go of all that they did to me, all the anger and the revenge feelings. And um, it's just allowed me to accept what had happened to me. And I really had to face it all and accept it. That's, sorry, it's a very long answer there to your question. No, not at all. I think it's a very useful answer to understand that because yeah. forgiveness is one of the toughest things to do yeah. for any human, you know, yeah. to have compassion and, and forgive somebody. And just before we got in into our discussion, I was, you know, I've mentioned to you in business there is a lot of abuse that goes on between customers and suppliers, yeah. forgetting about sexual abuse and harassment. I'm just talking about business to business relationships. And I remember mm -hmm. a number of instances in my time running my own business that I have been abused by yeah. clients, by suppliers. And, you know, you, you start to resent those individuals mm -hmm. and and I, and I know we're going off topic and we're looking at the business world a little bit, but I think it's relevant for this podcast because people that are looking to set up their own businesses will be dealing on their own rather than mm -hmm. through the accounts department or whatever. You know, they will be dealing with, with clients who do not pay on time, who may string things out, who may want a discount. I mean, I remember one incident where, you know, I've been on oh, several incidents where I've been taken to the cleaners, let's call it, you know, mm -hmm. where I haven't had my money or somebody's pr offered a supplier's offered to do something and haven't delivered. And I still feel resentment towards those people. Even today, mm -hmm. I haven't but forgiven that resentment, them. resentment, how does that impact on them? And what does it do to you by holding on to all that hurt and all that disappointment? It's only affecting you. Yeah, absolutely. 100% because they don't know I'm feeling that way. No, no idea. <laughs> no idea. They're carrying on with their lives as if nothing ever happened. They may not even realise that that's the effect they had on me. Yeah. They probably don't realise because I probably never said it. Um, you're 100% correct. And it's, it's, it's a massive problem. I, I use the story that you've just said about Donald Trump because he's mm -hmm. obviously a larger than life character on this planet at the moment. He and is, I, yeah. I always say to people, well, he wasn't born like he is today, right? Yeah. The world around him made him the person he is because yeah. he was conditioned. He saw the examples of wanting to amass wealth at any cost. Um, and that meant treating people badly. Um, if that's what it meant, that's what it meant, because he saw role models who were doing exactly the same. And this is how things happen. Yep, we all get conditioned. Yeah. Whether we're aware of it or not, we all get conditioned. And I guess for me, it was breaking out of my, my beliefs or my conditioning from what had happened to me. Yes, absolutely. 
and to bring an understanding. And I guess forgiveness to start with wasn't anything to do with them. It had to start with me. And it was, I suppose, about self-forgiveness or, or self-love. But it's a choice that we can all make, whatever happens to us. We can all choose to accept and let it go or stay bitter and twisted. And I know right now where I'd rather be. And it's not being bitter and twisted anymore. I don't know if you've come across uh, Byron Katie. Yes, I have, yeah. And, and you know, is it the four questions or five questions and the turnaround yeah. or the four questions and the turnaround um, yeah. with the work? And I always love what she says in terms of, you know, who would you be without that thought? Absolutely. So but then we become identified by it, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So who would I be without the thought that that company abused me mm -hmm. or that person abused me? Um, then I would be free. I would... I would be the best person I could possibly be. Yeah, um, well, hold, holding on is only, as we, I'm repeating myself, it's only harming you. Yeah. It only, it holds, I just felt like having all that anger and hate and revenge, it kept a part of me back. You know, there was a part of me that wasn't being authentic or real, whatever words you want to use. And just having to face everything that they had did to me. It was actually my refusal to accept what had happened that was actually driving me crazier than all the details in the end because it was my head just didn't want to accept. But once I chose to accept, you know, I am still alive. They didn't kill me. Mm. I have a really good life. Mm. I enjoy my life. I believe that life is for living. Um, you know, I, so in some ways I have a lot to be grateful to for these two young men because they, they have brought in for me so much gratitude. I really am so grateful that I wasn't killed. Many women in my position would have been killed. Mm. And they came very close to killing me, about three attempts. But somehow I was protected. I don't know mm. how. Mm. And I, here I am. I'm not dead. So, um, yeah, they, they taught me a lot. And it, and it is good that you are alive. And it's also good that you have shared your story. And that is helping thousands, hopefully millions of other people um and you are you know an ambassador to end this on this planet and hopefully everybody is going to get the message and i hope so <laughs> I'm, i mean i have three daughters so i really hope for them and their children that they would never experience the childhood that i had that mm. they would never understand or know what sexual violence is or sexual harassment you know maybe for their children there'll be a very different way that we are mm. Okay, so um, we've talked about your psychotherapy role. We've talked about your your book. Um, what about your public speaking that you do? How is that going? Sure. Well, it was really after I shared my story with the Forgiveness Project um, in 2014 that I just underestimated what the impact would be. And it was then, I've never set out to be a public speaker, but it was then that I was invited to do radio, TV interviews, people invited me to speak. So I've never really planned my um, public speaking lifestyle. But when I do one event, somebody else will ask me to do another event. And so it goes on. So I don't really look for the work, but it just kind of comes in. <laughs> so I'm very lucky that way as well. But I guess I'm an accidental public speaker. <laughs> yeah, of course. And mm. so did you do some training for it? Or? No. <laughs> no, no, no training. I am going soon, though, to, to do some training with, with a friend that I know who teaches people how to speak professionally, just in case there's anything that I can do. But, you know, I may be the worst person because I don't have slides. I know most people like slides. and I don't really ever plan, even though I, I do know my story. And I just, I'm very lucky. I don't get nervous. I just think, well, it's not about me anymore. It's what it can do for other people. And somehow when I open my mouth, the words just come in. And every time I speak without fail, People in the audience, in the break or at the end, will tell me their story. There's always a handful of people that share their story with me. And that's just what motivates me to carry on speaking out. And um, let me burst your bubble around slides. Mm -hmm. OK. <laughs> Nobody likes slides. Okay. So I always think I should have a lovely professional PowerPoint or something going on, but I don't. Definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. Okay, I'm, I'm the most critical person when it comes to presenters or speakers when they're using 
Okay. Umpteen slides. There's, because what they're doing is they're looking at the slide, not connecting with you as a public speaker. Mm. And, you know, the only image you ever need to have if they give you the facility is the image of your book. Okay. Uh, because <laughs> you're a public speaker, but you're also promoting your book at the end of the day. Yeah. And, you know, whether you do book signings at the end of your speaking or whatever, it's it's that type of method that I would say would would really be suitable because, yeah, no slides, uh, Madeline. Please don't put any slides okay, up there. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> so far, I haven't even thought about them, so we're okay. <laughs> well, I'm I, always worried that if I if I prepared or if I had slides that I would forget something and then I would panic more. So I just really trust that the words will come and they always have come. That is really amazing advice and very, very correct as well, because people panic when they rehearse stuff yeah. and then they panic they've forgotten something that they've rehearsed. But yeah. of course, the audience never knows what you've forgotten, no. <laughs> right? No. And although you are telling your story and you've told it many times now, so it's becoming ingrained into you, there will be aspects that you will have missed, but nobody knows that. Yes, you know? and it's different every time, and I do allow for questions and answers. And people, once they got over the shock of what I had to tell them, they do ask really good questions and answers. It's different, actually, in different countries. It's been quite interesting. And that then opens up in a different way again. And if you forget something, a question will normally prompt something. You go, oh, yeah, I could mention this now. So it's, it's, it, it always goes however it's meant to go. You know, I just really trust life. Yeah, I agree. And well, that's a great philosophy in terms of saying that trust life. Yep. And it, it does help enormously because you're sharing a personal story. Yep. And one of the things that I do is, is teach people how to do storytelling okay. in terms of their business, right? Um, because the most interesting bit about anybody is their own story. You know, if you look at LinkedIn profiles, people do not write about themselves, they write about the company or they write about their qualifications. They never write a story about themselves, yeah. which of course is the most interesting bit about anybody. Now you have a very powerful story, mm -hmm. which will really um, be memorable to people and be shocking as well. So it will make it more memorable that way. But you're, you're right, What if you have, and this is advice for anybody who wants to do public speaking, if you have a story to share, that's what you have to do rather than this is my product or service, buy me type of thing, you yeah. know. And I always go back to what Marina Cantacazuno, the founder of the Forgiveness Project, calls us that we are story healers rather than storytellers. And the sharing of our story is not just healing for myself, but it's what it can do for other people. Now, I, I think is incredible description, very, very yeah. powerful. Definitely. Yeah. The sharing of our narratives is so powerful mm. and we need, we need stories to be shared. Absolutely. Absolutely. And more people need to, you know, do that and share their story. And you, I think what you're doing is allowing people to do that. So because of you doing it, people are inspired by you and therefore have the courage to come out and share theirs as well. Absolutely. And it was the same for me. It was the courage of me, of someone else that helped me to find my voice. And so I intend to pay that forward as well. So hopefully through your journey, there will be lots of healing taking place by people sharing their, you know, yeah. story and their, their, and become a story healer themselves as well. Absolutely. Even just for ourselves, even if we only tell ourselves our story, you know, because everyone's so caught in denial and secrecy and shame. Just but the, the single most thing that really helped me on my journey was to find my voice. And to, when I spoke my truth, it was like I was standing in my power. Mm. So I know that my voice is now my power mm. and I, I intend to use it. <laughs> Very, very, very good advice. Thank you for that. And so how, how do you see, and um, I, I hope you're getting paid for speaking. You know, some events I do get paid for and, and some I don't get paid for and, and both is fine. If, it, if I don't get paid and I'm traveling away, then they will always pay for my hotel or my um, 
accommodation. And that's okay. If they're a small charity and they can't afford it, I'm okay. But some events will cover, I'll get paid, you know, more than enough and that will cover that. And I'm very lucky. I don't need to do it for the money and I'm, I'm not motivated by money as well, which is, I'm, I'm in a fortunate position in my lifestyle. So I will just do whatever really comes in. And if it feels okay, then I'll do it. And if it doesn't feel okay, then I won't do it. And that, I think, is also really good advice because there are lots of people out there that do public speaking, mm -hmm. you know, as a profession and they only want to get paid for it. But I'm like you, I, I do the same, you know, if people can, they will. If they can't, then that's fine too, as long as, yeah. you know, people pay mm -hmm. expenses or there's some other way that it helps your promotion. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. of what, what you're doing and getting the message out there. And I think that's the important thing for you is getting the message out there. Yeah, the last one of the last big events I did was a men's charity in Bradford, and it was for men and young boys that had experienced childhood sexual exploitation. And they couldn't afford to pay me, but they paid my expenses. But I felt very important that I had to be there. You know, there was a pull to be there to share my story, because I think for men it must be even harder to come out and say, well, look, this has happened to me too as well. Mm. So uh, it felt that it was the right thing to do. But, I, you know, I, I turned things down as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's fine. Mm. And what what's next or how do you see things evolving from from here with the three things that you're doing in your life? How, how do you see it developing? And have you got a vision or a mission with all of this? <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. As I said, you know, I don't really plan any of the events or anything that, that comes in. And I just really wait and see what comes next. And there, I have been approached by somebody, which I can't really speak about at the moment. And if this takes off, it will be going in a completely different direction, which I never saw happening. Mm. So I can let you know in a month or two when we find out. <laughs> oh, please do come back to me yeah. and, and let us know. And I'll, I can add it to the show notes or something that will cool. be really interesting. Oh, Madeline, is there, is there anything that from my questions that we haven't covered that you think you'd like to share with everybody? Um, I would just say to anyone who's listening, male or female, that if they've ever experienced any crime or any form of sexual abuse or violence, that it's never, ever too late to get help. You know, I was as you mentioned before, I've been interviewed by some amazing people, and one of them was Sir Trevor MacDonald, and it wasn't... It was fantastic to speak to him, but it was what took place afterwards that was more amazing. I was contacted by a friend whose mum had been listening. She was 81. And basically, after she heard me speaking about my experience of rape as a teenager, she told her daughter, my friend, that she had also been raped. And that day, she ended 64 years of silence. Oh, my God. And so that, to me, is the power in sharing our stories and also it for her to find her voice and not to go to her grave with that secret, that shameful secret that she thought it was, to me, that just empowers me and motivates me and encourages me to carry on speaking out. And every time I speak, I think of just that one woman. Yeah, absolutely. So if, they, if people would like to learn more about you, uh, about your book, where can they mm -hmm. get in touch with you or see sure. and listen um, to all your interviews mm -hmm. and... Yeah, I have a website, which is madlaneblack.co.uk, or I'm on Twitter, which is madblack65. On Instagram, I have a public Facebook page, which is uh, Madeleine Black Unbroken, or on LinkedIn as well. How could I forget? That's where we met. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you've got all a, over the place. <laughs> you're, you're everywhere. So people, yeah. they just need to Google you and they'll find That's all it. those places. They will. But... Yep. I'll, I'll put it in the show notes anyway so that people can click through and, and find you and hopefully, you know, help you and help everybody else spread the message and get it out there. Now, it's been a while since I've been to Scotland. Okay. So if you're ever in the Midlands in Birmingham or, or you know, do let me know and we'll, we'll have do. a coffee and a chat okay. and Sounds a catch good. up. But thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing your story and um, keep in touch. Thank you. And you're very welcome. And thank you for inviting me onto your show. It's been great. My pleasure. Okay, bye. Bye for now. Staying Alive UK.
Share your story. 